Hi there, um, my name is Jason. I'm a social worker and founder of the Social Work Action Group. At the SWAG, we've been running a national language and social work campaign where we encourage our profession to stop and think critically and compassionately about the language that we use every day. And we've had amazing video contributions from all across the country, from practitioners, from managers, from parents, from care experienced young people, academics and others. And we're so happy that we've been able to put them all together in this one video and um, for you, for your learning, for your development. And I hope you find them useful. Hello, my name is Breach Featherston and I'm here to talk to you about why language matters in social work. Well, language matters in everything, really. It's how we communicate with each other uh, primarily. I mean, we do communicate uh, through our facial expressions and touch, etc. But crucially, we use words. We use words to reach out. We use words to exclude. We use, use words to convey affection. We use words to harm, to humiliate, to shame to hurt. Uh, so words are very, very powerful. All of us have had experiences in our lives of having words used in ways that actually made us feel terrible. And there's that old phrase, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And it's actually profoundly wrong. It's really wrong. We can choose to not allow words to hurt us, but usually they do hurt us. And that's why people, historically people in positions of um, uh, lack of power, people who had lacked power, have argued and fought for uh, to rename things, to contest the names they were called and to articulate alternative names. I'm going to talk very, very quickly about a phrase that social workers use often in families that is experienced often by parents as very shaming and harmful and hurtful. It's when they say, I'm the child's social worker. And that actually is experienced by parents as a unrealistic and daft because actually children and their parents are in relationships and you can't delineate one from the other in any straightforward sense. But also it often can convey a profound lack of interest in the parents and a lack of respect in terms of trying to understand why they may be parenting as they are and what difficulties they may be experiencing. So language really matters. We need to think a lot about what words we use when we're talking to people and when we're trying to convey uh, uh, mean uh, when we're trying to convey things to them. We can convey a great deal of respect by inclusive language, but we can also convey a great deal of disrespect uh, if we're not careful and we're not thoughtful. My name is Talia and this is Thea. And we want to talk to you today about language. Language is important because language is the foundation of communication and communication is the building blocks of relationships. Everything we do to help children and families, everything we do to combat injustice and inequality requires that we build and strengthen relationships. And when you reduce people to acronyms, you take away their individuality and their purpose. You reduce people to a shell of who they really are. And you take away their humanity and their dignity. When you're communicating, it's important that the to acknowledge that the language that you use builds people up or can tear them down, and it defines them and it limits them. When you're working with families, we want you to stop holding us at arm's length. Don't other us. We want you to realize that even if we're facing huge challenges, we need your support and we need you to use language that will help us reach our goals, not yours. Children need their parents and parents want to be what their children need. And we need you to use language that strengthens and empowers us and to stop using acronyms that makes it easier to forget that we're just like you. Thank you very much. We say bye. Hi, my name is Nargis. I am care experienced, a foster carer and now a newly qualified social worker. 
In this short video, I'd like to give you a brief reflection on some of my thoughts about the use of language in social work practice. From my experience, both professional and non-professional capacities, I believe that the most powerful tool we carry as practitioners is indeed our language. Language has a way of carrying an afterlife. And what I mean by that is that pe people in general carry and hold on to memories and moments most meaningful to them, even non-meaningful moments. And within those moments, the language that we use remains very much alive. And so this is what most people mean about language being oppressive, is that element of reliving what someone has said, how someone has said it, is very much a reality for our clients and young people. One of the biggest changes I'd like to see in myself, in my own practice, and for, the, for those of you watching, is for us to slow down and really sit with this uncomfortable feeling when we don't know how to approach something, how to ask something. I want us to consciously think about what is it that we're asking and how we will go about doing that. I want us to become more conscious practitioners in the language that we use with our clients and our young people. Thank you. Hi, I'm Winston Mawson, 10 years qualified and a full-time independent social worker. Now, to my fellow social workers, we know the importance of good communication, but you know, we often work in environments that aren't really conducive to making sure that we communicate well with people. So really, we have to make sure we don't ignore that context. So with that in mind, here are my three tips about how you can make sure that you can support people that you're working with when it comes to communication. So the first thing is don't overpromise. Be realistic about your goals from the outset. And that way, you're not setting yourself up to fail because that's exactly the sort of thing that really can erode trust. Number two, don't ever leave any kind of dead air. Make sure that you're really using your out of office, your voicemails to let people know what might be going on for you, where you might be. And if you're delayed for things, let people know in advance as much as you can. Because again, sort of being delayed and not telling people what's going on with you is exactly the sort of thing that can erode trust. And three, be real. You are a practitioner, you are a professional, but you are also a human being. So, you know, always explain when things go wrong or you fall short and don't be afraid to apologise and fall in your sword. Take responsibility so that everybody can move on because, yes, once again, when you don't do that, it's exactly the sort of thing that erodes trust. And for those who aren't social workers, don't be afraid to hold your worker to account for, for exactly these kind of things when you feel communication has fallen down and make sure that you feel that these things can get nipped in the bud straight away. So good luck to everyone. Hi, I'm Carleen Furman and I'm head of the Contextual Safeguarding Program at the University of Bedfordshire, where I'm a Principal Research Fellow. And I've been asked to talk about why language is so important for social work from the perspective of contextual safeguarding. Um, one of the first things that we do when we support children's services departments to think about taking a contextual safeguarding approach is we observe meetings between professionals and we review case files um, where professionals have written information about children and families who are affected by abuse and different forms of harm in extra familial contexts. And the language in those meetings and in those files tell us a lot about where risk is being situated and where safety is or is not being considered. And often when we started to develop contextual safeguarding, we would see issues like sexual exploitation being described as an issue about the child. And so the language used to describe the issue at hand would be very much focused on the child. Um, they are manipulative. They are absconders. Um, they are 
um, hard to reach. And the one we still hear most often in meetings is um, they won't engage with our service. And this type of language can have a real impact on the ability of social workers to build relationships with young people and ultimately um, work with others and young people themselves to keep them safe. Because if we locate the issue as being with the child, then our intervention focuses on fixing that child, fixing that issue. And in meetings, we hear people then very much focused on fixing that child. So um, they're absconding. Well, what do we do about their behaviour? How do we stop them from absconding? Can we instill more curfews? Do we need to restrict their liberty? Um, what things can we do to tell them the consequences of their behaviour to stop them from behaving in that way? Or they won't engage with our service we offered so we'll close now. The responsibility rests with the young person to increase safety and doesn't facilitate collaboration or partnership between young people, their families and carers and the professional network. From a contextual safeguarding perspective, therefore, we really encourage discussions about the context and situation in which that young person finds themselves. And in terms of engagement, then really describing the fact that we have not been able to engage this young person in our service. Because if we start saying we haven't been able to engage, rather than they won't engage, we open up a problem solving, contextualized conversation about our next steps. We haven't been able to engage them, why is that? Is it the offer that we're making? Is it the worker? Is it the situation that the young person is in, which means it's just unsafe for them to participate in what is being offered to them? Once we open up and explore that conversation, not just amongst ourselves, but with young people and those that they trust, we open up opportunities to create safety for them. And so when we develop contextual safeguarding approaches, what we're doing is encouraging professionals to describe the context and situations a young person is in and support them to describe those contexts and not simply describe the behaviour that they see and therefore not simply engage with the young person in regards to the decisions that that young person alone is making. The more we can talk about context and situations, the more we move from an individualised model of um, child protection, social work and safeguarding practice, we move away from that and towards a contextual safeguarding approach. Thank you. Hello, it's Wayne Reid from Baswa. I'm here to talk to you about language very briefly. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of some of my work on anti-racism um, with regards to language. Um, I unapologetically um, translate Black Lives Matter into the work that I'm involved in um, as far as anti-racism in social work goes um, and I make it relevant uh, hopefully to um, social work. Uh, so that's a key aspect of language for me, that translation of the essence really of Black Lives Matter and what that stands for. Uh, from a social justice point of view, as opposed to a political one, or as well as a, a political one. Um, and also, uh, in terms of politics, with a small p, uh, I think language is important uh, in terms of how certain words like uh, woke um, and victimhood have now entered mainstream um, discussions and discourses. And when we look at the definitions of some of those words, actually uh, you know they have uh, a sort of more innocent meaning um, but actually the interpretation of them uh, and the meaning of them seems to have um, altered and become more negative so I think we have to take account of that as well um, looking at things from a critical thinking point of view and finally uh, BAME um, I'm sure many people will be aware I'm not um, a fan of that term and I don't want anyone to call me BAME. For the people who want to be called BAME, fair enough. But, you know, I'm a black guy. Um, I'm happy to be seen as part of an ethnic minority group, uh, part of a global majority group. Um, and that's why I feel uh, language is important. Thank you for listening.
Hello, I'm Zoe Thomas, I'm a social work academic. Communication is so important in anti-racist social work because without it, the spaces of silence and ignorant, ignorance can allow professional fear to manifest. And when we're scared, we can become defensive or avoidant. And this means we can just totally miss the valuable and enriching opportunities for learning and connection. And to practice effectively, social workers need to be aware that it's okay to make mistakes. It's really okay to get things wrong. But what's important is that we own our mistakes, we acknowledge them and we learn from them. But more importantly, we need to be aware that those in power have got our back. <laughs> they need to be equipping us with social work education, social work CPD training that is anti-racist. They need to be empowering us and giving us confidence to sit with our fear, to hold our discomfort and embrace those in uncomfortable spaces. And what changes would I like to see? Hmm, everything needs to change. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Susan. I've been a social worker for over 25 years and this is my video for World Social Work Day. I was asked to give some consideration as to what changes I would like to see that would make it easier for social care organisations to support action being taken against racism and allowing people to speak out against racism. And the answer for me came after I read a blog today that was on the British Association of Social Works website, which explored the fact that people of colour and people with disabilities are more likely to fail their ASYE or to have their ASYE delayed. It was noted that people of colour were more likely to face scrutiny. It was noted that people with disabilities were likely to face delays in having the reasonable adjustments made that would allow them to finish their work. And that led to delays in passing their ASYE and it also led to an increased and disproportionate rate of failure for people of colour and for people with disabilities. So the change that I would like to see is pretty much across the board when it comes to practice education. I would like to see more diversity in terms of the people that are actually practice educators. I'd like to see more diversity um, amongst the people that deliver the practice education training. I would like to see more consideration of the impact of structural racism and how that can impact on people who are coming into social work as trainers, as trainees, I should say. And also I'd like to see increased diversity in the amount of people that are on um, internal and external moderation boards at ASYE. I was part of an ASY internal moderation. I was the only person of colour there. And coincidentally, I was the only person that pointed out how there was a lack of discussion of the impact of structural racism in one otherwise excellent portfolio where that was particularly relevant. And I do have to wonder that if I wasn't there, would that conversation have even taken place? We need diversity because it brings about a range of experience and a range of ideas. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vicky. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am disabled. I am queer. I'm a cisgender woman. I am a social worker and I've had social workers. Language is really important in social work. Language is always changing and also language can be quite personal. So it's really important for social workers to understand the changing nature of language and also to ask people preferred terms, preferred language. I would really like social workers working with disabled people to understand the social model of disability and why many, many or the majority of disabled people prefer identity first language. In the same way I say I am queer I also say I am disabled. I do not say I'm a person with queerness and I don't say I'm a person with a disability. Some people prefer person first language. So it's really important to note the difference. I'd also really like social workers to find out with people that they work with, what is the best way for them to communicate? For example, some people really can't handle talking on the telephone. Some disabled people find that really, really difficult. So communicate 
by text or by email if that's what the person prefers because sometimes it's just easier and accommodates someone's disability. If a social worker uses words or phrases that I don't like, then that stops the relationship there and then. I've had a social worker tell me that I should be grateful my life isn't that bad um, and I should just get on with it. Um, that's not actually helpful if someone is in crisis or struggling. That's really not a helpful thing to say. It's also really important that if you've listened to me, you're going to use the language that I like um, and the language that I prefer. And if you've kept up to date with those sort of things, I'm going to have a lot more respect for you. And I hope that in my keeping up to date with things and using language you prefer, that we can build a relationship too. The change I'd like to see in the way that social work services communicate is that they keep up to date with language. They are very much about the people that they work with and not broad terms that can be quite othering. Um, and I just like people to be always as up to date as they can be and respectful of everyone's preferences. I think it's important for social workers to be aware of the language and the phrases that they use. Um, when I was younger, I had a really fantastic uh, relationship with my social worker and everything was wonderful. I relied on them quite a lot, probably more than I should have, but there was a bond. And when I finally told them about my sexuality um, and how my birth mother had received that news by saying that it was just a phase he agreed with it he did say in his words where she's probably right and you'll find out in time now i i know that that's not a dismissal of my sexuality um or my place in the lgbt community but just by reaffirming the place of a woman who had no real place of importance anymore in my life and who had been quite derogatory to me, that relationship broke down. So I think as a social worker in practice, it's really important that you're aware of everything we say. Now, people are only human and things happen. But I think when you're working with young people or working with anyone, the language that we use can be just dismissive to us, but two or three words can absolutely break a person, break a relationship and stop the person wanting to bond with you or wanting to come with you, confide in you, ask for help. And I think that's what happened with me. So I think my message would be just be diligent in how you approach the subject of sexuality or just approach in, in general and I think you'll be fine. Hi everyone, my name's Danielle and my pronouns are she, her, hers and I'm a PhD researcher and university lecturer. I specialise in LGBTQ plus research, specifically trans, non-binary and genderqueer identity. Today, I'm going to be chatting to you all about pronouns as the Social Work Action Group launches their new campaign on language in social work, which you can follow using the hashtag for the record. A pronoun is a word that refers to either the people talking, such as I or you, or someone that is being talked about. Gender pronouns specifically refer to people that you are talking about. She, her, hers and he, him, his are a few commonly used pronouns. There's also lots of gender neutral pronouns in use. And here's some that you might have heard before. They, them, theirs. This is a pretty common gender neutral pronoun and it can also be used in the singular. 
But there's so many more pronouns that people use, including things like Z and here. And some people prefer not to use pronouns at all and just use their name as a pronoun instead. But why is this important? You can't always know what someone's pronouns are just by looking at them. Asking and then correctly using someone's pronouns shows that you respect them and their gender identity. If someone's referred to with the wrong pronouns, it can make them feel really disrespected, invalidated and even dysphoric. It's a privilege not to have to worry about which pronouns someone is going to use for you based on how they perceive your gender. So let's use that privilege to be inclusive and welcoming of all gender identities. But what happens if we make a mistake? It is OK. Everyone slips up from time to time. The best thing to do if you do use the wrong pronoun is just to say something straight away like, sorry, I'm an, and then insert their pronoun. If you realise your mistake after you've finished the conversation, just apologise in private and move on. Don't make a big deal out of it. A lot of the time it can be really tempting to go on about how bad you feel that you've messed up someone's pronouns. But please don't. This is really inappropriate as it makes the person who you misgendered feel really awkward and responsible for comforting you, which is not their job. As a top tip, they aren't preferred pronouns, they are pronouns. It's not a preference, it's someone's identity. And being mindful of how we address people is one of the easiest ways to be an ally for the LGBT community and a respectful person all round. If you want any more information, please do check out the Social Work Action Group Twitter account or my own Twitter account, which is at DJROE95. Thank you for sticking around with me and learning about pronouns. Keep safe and I'll see you all soon. Someone who is LGBT, it always made me really uncomfortable when they made the assumption that I was straight or, you know, made the odd comments about when I was older. And it can, if you're like talking to a, a young person who maybe doesn't really know what they are, who they are, use like that bad, like that creates a barrier for that young person's future when really we should be using language that is free and open. Language and terminology um, in the care sector, how important is it? It's, it's very important, you know. We have to be very cautious and careful about the lexicon we use, especially because it segregates from people, it makes them feel unwanted, it makes them feel inadequate makes them feel like robots and they're not robots are they they're human beings you know uh i always felt worthless when i was uh, in in a professional environment and i was referred to as a looked after child and it's archaic you know the care sector hasn't changed but the world around it has and we've got to somehow modernize the way we use our language and because we know we, we know it starts at the foundations and when your people come into care the last thing they need is is to be made to feel worthless, like they're scum, and you know there's that division that automatically between authorities and young people. We, we've got to try to close that gap somehow and unite uh, as a collaborative, and give people the respect they deserve. Um, and we'll get it back, won't we? And that's just how it works for me. Very passionate about that. Language is is the way forward. You know, to change the care sector for the future, we've got to change the language, and that will help everything else around it. use of language is really important. It's important because it means a lot to a lot of people and it means really different things. So if I was looking for a blue square and someone was saying a red circle is a blue square, we would all be confused. So it means a lot to be clear and transparent and to understand the words that we're using mean the same things to each other. Words are the only way that we can communicate by writing, so emails, reports, things like that. There obviously are lots of other ways to communicate, non-verbal ways and so on, but the written word is what tends to come through with report writing and information sharing.
So that language has to be really correct and the words used have to be representational of what everybody involved thinks. So it's really important to me that the right words, agreed words, chosen words are used when talking about me and my family. Those words mean something to us and it affects all of us when those words aren't used. It makes us feel unimportant, it makes us um, not feel valued or listened to and we're very careful to always use words that are respectful and kind towards other people. Hi, my name is Tammy Mays. I'd like to talk to you today about language and why it's important. I am a parent and I have lived experience as social workers and a sister. For me, language is about, is the be end and end all. There is no two ways. Life is about building people up, not tearing people down. And language is a big part of that. The language you use in relationships is about being positive and using words that don't dehumanise people, don't degrade people. Take service user, for instance. Service user makes people feel demeaning, not important not valued and yet we are the parents we are the ones that brought the child into the world we are the ones that are doing everything in our power to keep that child safe we're the ones that stay up with that child 24 7 if they're ill we're the ones that will fight their corner when no one else will because we know our children we are more than a service user, we are parents. Regarding, there's other words as well that get used, like contact. It should be called family time. Contact is not about contact, it's family time. You're building a relationship with children and parents. It shouldn't be called contact. Thank you for listening. I want to talk about the language that we use because I think that words really matter and the words that we choose to use can make things really clear or really complicated. They can help people to understand or they can cause confusion. They can make people feel included in what's going on or they can make people feel left out of a conversation. I think most of us will agree that jargon is unhelpful and plain English is better. But in our professional world, we're so surrounded by jargon that we don't always notice it. And a really good example of this is the term service users. We use this term routinely, but many of the people the term aims to describe dislike it intensely. Over the years, we've used labels like patients and clients and customers. These aren't just words. They all say something about the way we see each other. So they're very important. They convey messages about relationships and power dynamics. So clients, which is the term that we used when I first started in social work, suggested a passive recipient of my expertise. Patients, it's a clinical term, and again, it suggests someone who's just seen in terms of their need. We dallied with the term customer for a while. This connects to the purchaser provider split of care management. This language and this model of service provision massively simplified complex situations that are faced by people and their families, suggesting that they could just buy a service to resolve the issues they faced. I mean, I think this term dumbs down the social work role. Again, not recognising the complexity of people's lives, but suggesting that a bit of signposting would do the trick, so really anyone could do it. But personally, I dislike the term service user so much, it's, it's hard to know where to start. To me, it suggests dependency. Its emphasis is on the process of using a service rather than indicating whether that service might, might even be helpful. So I think it gives an unhelpful steer and perhaps it's partly responsible for our focus on what we do 
rather than whether we're actually having any impact. So how many assessments did we do rather than did the person feel any better for having spent any time with us? It leads us towards counting and people's experiences and emotions aren't easily counted. For me, the term is reductive. It sees people in terms of their engagement with services rather than as whole people. So, um, you know, if I use services, I'm not just using services. I'm, I'm a mum and I'm a sister and I'm a daughter and I'm a trampolina and I'm a really bad singer. And I don't want to be labelled in terms of any one aspect of my life, particularly not a term that doesn't afford me the status that I think we all really need. I mean, really, I struggle with any generic term that reduces people into a part of their sum. I think the term service user others us. It denies our diversity. It simplifies our existence and presents us in terms of needs and dependencies. And this puts the services, and that's often you and me, in a powerful position, but it disempowers the person. And does this matter? Well, I really think it does. Labels suggest a power dynamic, and I think they describe a relationship rather than the person. So for social workers to call people service users, to me, suggests that person is only seen in terms of their need for a bit of help. And we all need a bit of help sometimes, and we don't need to be defined by it. it. Needing help is part of being human. When you come to think of it, when we're not using services, service users are people. Now there's a good term. Hi, um, it's nice to be able to do this for SWAG. The fact that SWAG is like this coalition of um, lived experience and also professionals um, in the system trying to make the change, I think is a really good one. Um, they asked the question, why is language important in social work? Um, so yeah, I thought I'd give her an off the cuff answer. And in some ways I'm a bit like, I don't want to try and give the definitive on this. There's something about actually what I think about language is that it's a shared thing. Um, and um, But I was actually, um, the other day I had a nice moment where somebody said that they see me and that I've, I, like, I felt seen by somebody and uh, which that set of words seems to be like quite a recent one to me. I don't know, that's the first time somebody said that to me before. Uh, but uh, so it's like the gift of um, recognition that language can give us sometimes um, that, to recognise the other person or to recognise something in us or in some what's happening between you and I or the system that's around us. Maybe in our context, we might talk about the the system. And uh, so I wouldn't want to draw like real tight formulations or lists around the language. But I mean, I understand that some labels can be really um, corrosive inhibitors of progress can, um, and be very damaging and harmful and that some words can really generate belonging um, so I think the, the individual words are important but to some extent my feeling is that they're shifting around um, quite considerably uh, so I wanted to give you a little s segment here a few sentences from Sylvia Winter, who's this brilliant um, Jamaican writer who my friend uh, Beverly Barnett Jones um, sent me her book. And um, But this is a little section from an interview that she gave recently, uh, recently in the context of COVID and all the other things that are going on. And Sylvia Winter said, the only cure will be a transformation of the whole society and an entirely new knowledge order altogether. Otherwise, we'll remain trapped in this. It is, not, it is through language that you and I are able to sit and talk with each other, develop a mechanism to understand one another. Do you see the immense potential there? Language is entirely the point. And so I'll, I'll leave you on that one and I'll just give you a little um, fist bump. All right, see you later.